from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening at the Library of Congress. My name is Nicholas Brown. I'm a music specialist and one of the producers of the library's concert series. We're very pleased to have with us tonight the Talis Scholars, who don't need much of an introduction because I'm sure we all know how important and significant their work has been over the last several decades. Um, and for you especially, we have a treat, and that is their director and founder, Peter Phillips, who will be spending a few moments pre-concert with us here to chat about uh, the work of the Talis Scholars and we'll hopefully get into some of their uh, really significant, groundbreaking work in the, in the realm of uh, recordings and also developing their own record label, which is, of course, um, was, was very novel back then and now it seems like everyone's copying you. <laughs> Uh, so, the basic format is we'll spend some time chatting up here. I have some questions for Peter, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A towards the end. And without further ado, we will we'll just jump into it. Uh, Peter, tonight is your debut at the Library of Congress. It is. Which is exciting for us, and hopefully exciting for you too. Yes. Uh, what has been your experience of touring in the United States over the many tours that you've had? Yes. Um well, this is our 68th tour to North America, but basically to the, to the US. Um, this is our 32nd concert in DC, even though it's our first here. A lot of those were in the Folger Shakespeare Library, actually. Uh, quite a long time ago now. Hmm. So I feel I know, I know DC well. But um, so the question really, I suppose, is how have the audiences changed? Is that Yes, sure, there? that'd be great. <laughs> yes. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> the first tour was in 1981, um, when we were all very much younger. Um, and I, I just don't remember what they were. I mean, they, they, there always seemed to be a really enthusiastic response, anyway, that, that this music is much loved here and, and treated with respect. That's always been the case. Um, and I've been, I've, what I've liked very much is that I've had, I felt I've had free range to choose music that I wanted to do and that you would like to come and hear it, basically. Uh, so I've experimented with a lot of repertoire here, in, and whereas in other countries I can't necessarily do that. So thank you very much for that opportunity because one of the delights for me is that the Renaissance period is such a big period of, of music which a lot of people don't know very well. And I've just really enjoyed roaming through it, you know, really without anyone telling me not to or, or wish that I was just doing the Allegri Miserere in every concert or, I don't know, whatever. You know, I mean, that does happen in places, but not here. So it's been great, really has. Mm. Have you seen the demographics of the audiences change at all over the years, maybe in specific cities? N no, I think... The, when we, I don't know, um, no, I think the age, the, the, the average age has remained very much the same, actually. I mean, children tend not to come to this, <laughs> unless, it's, <laughs> unless it's got a really catchy Christmas title, and then they're always disappointed because <laughs> we're not doing what they expect, so that's not really... Though I have had children come up, you know, at the end, and they've sat there silent for two hours, enthralled, genuinely, I think, rather than being told not to move. Um, and uh, Yes, I mean, uh, but then working, I don't know, sort of uh, up to sort of 30, not so many people, I think. But after that, I think, I'd say it's grouped in the 30 to 40, 50 range, probably, mm -hmm. and has remained like that. In your current and most recent tours to the US, have you ended up in cities that you had not performed in before? Or is mm, all the time. Oh, really? Mm. How about on this tour? Anyway? Well, on this tour, I've never been to Harrisonburg. Where is that? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I th Sorry, for anyone from there. <laughs> I'm from up north. So it's, yeah. uh, every tour, there's, there's, there's someone. Laramie, Wyoming, that's quite oh, good. Yeah. Yes, mm, makes you think. <laughs> Well, actually, the problem with Laramie, Wyoming, is that it's so high up mm -hmm. that um, we find it hard to breathe properly when we're singing. 
let alone conducting, incidentally. But uh, <laughs> so, well, yeah. But anyway, I mean, yeah, all, uh, lots of different experiences. Great, great. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, and this is going a bit of far field. Uh, far field. The different venues you perform in in the UK and maybe London specifically. What kinds of things do you do differently to prepare for performances in the different venues? For example. Um, Wigmore Hall versus Cadogan Hall versus Albert Hall, if you've had anything mm. there recently. We have, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, these are vastly different venues. Uh, and we really have to adapt to a lot of different spaces. And certainly the difference between Cadogan Hall and the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> I mean, you could, I don't know how many Cadogan's hall, halls you could fit into the Albert Hall, but it must be sort of like 50. Um, it's a sort of, if you stand on the stage there and you look at the audience, they're about half a mile away. I mean, it's just incredible. And, and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you have to immediately, you can't, if you over sing, it, it's not a good idea, obviously. Um, if you panic, it's not a good idea. But, but I think, I th you just, you just do what you do. There's nothing you can do with the Albert Hall. The, the, the audience have to get used to how far away they are from the stage. That's basically what it is. Whereas in Cadogan Hall, um, the danger is it's going to be too loud for everybody. Uh, so we have to sort of tailor down a bit. But then there are those build. I mean, there's also the difference in acoustical properties. I mean, there are buildings like cathedral buildings which tend to have quite a lot of reverberation, but it's, it's sort of not localized, it's sort of all round. So in those buildings, we can relax in the sense that the building will probably take the sound and, and round it. So it makes our lives a little bit easier. But they also make our lives more difficult in that we can't hear each other so well. So the ensemble gets a bit more difficult to control. And I have to be very, very precise with where the beat is because that's when people get lost, basically. Uh, and then there are those buildings that are huge buildings, but totally dry. I mean, bone dry, you know, there's nothing. The sound stops in your throat. <laughs> those are awful places. But I mean, they, they, can, be, they can be secular or sacred. As in our experience, there's not much difference. And, and people who say to us, you should always do this music in a sacred space, I don't agree with them necessarily. I mean, there are fantastic symphony halls built to very modern specifications of acoustical clarity, like the Birmingham Symphony Hall where we're singing this time next week, um, which are just fantastic to sing in. They're, they're so encouraging and, and um, beautifully laid out for the audience so that, that the audience are comfortable too. Not always the case in cathedrals. I don't know. Everyone has their own take on that. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a bit about the founding of Gimmel and also uh, maybe what some of your goals were and if those goals have been achieved over the course of its, its longevity? Yes, uh, certainly the goals have been achieved in that we've been able to, to just record what we wanted to record and to experiment with repertoire in a way that um, a big record label in the old days would never have allowed us to do. They, they would, they would, there wasn't enough famous stuff, basically. I mean, we, so we... I mean, the first record we ever made was for EMI, um, and that had the Allegri on it. Well, you can't record the Allegri over and over and over again, obviously, because it's dim diminishing returns. But with, with Gimmel, we were able to, we sold enough copies right from the start to, to finance, experiment. We could experiment, take risks, explore new music. And so, yes, and, and, and it started in 1980, because nobody else wanted us. I mean, actually, we did that EMI record, and it was a great success, actually, but that was it. And we came up with another idea, and no, that was no good. They, they had to sell thousands and thousands of copies every day. And of course, what we've done is sell thousands, or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies of, of some of those discs over a period of 30 years. But the, record, the, old, the big record companies never had the tolerance for that. What kind of uh, medium were you using? Were you originally with CDs or had you st started with vinyl? No, we started with the vinyl. Mm. And it was very difficult. In, uh, this was in 1980 to about 1984 mm -hmm. when vinyl, everyone had got enough vinyls in their lives and in their houses actually because they're very heavy. Um, and the, those shelves of vinyls, I, I heard of people's floors collapsing <laughs> under really? the weight of them. <laughs> 
Anyway, by about 1982, everyone had had enough of it. And, and th th then we, we made our first digital recording, which wasn't for CD, but the digits were available mm -hmm. in 83. And then the, the first CDs became, uh, were invented in 84, I think it was. And we were very quick onto them because um, we, saw this, we saw the potential. And now in this climate of digital streaming and download and that kind of business, um, how are you handling that from a business perspective? Well, it's disastrous. I mean, the, the, people are not buying CDs anymore. Um, and there's nothing to replace the income from CDs. Downloading is okay, but it's not nearly as good. Um, uh, and also, it's dying off. I saw today the, um, the UK numbers for November had vinyl sales above digital downloads for the first time, which is wild. <laughs> yeah, that is wild. <laughs> and it was a, like a, a fourfold increase in vinyl sales from one year ago on a monthly basis, mm. which is pretty interesting. There are a lot of people out there who would love to think that vinyl is coming back. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're one of those. No, 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 no. I have enough already. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, the, prop the immediate problem is that CDs are not selling, mm -hmm. and the substitute that's killed the CD market off used to be okay and is now also falling. Uh, uh, but streaming is the thing, so, and we, there's almost no revenue from it. We're, it's... It's really serious. Well, we, we simply have to change the business model, I suppose. I mean, we can't pay the fees to the singers or go to the interesting places we used to go to to record in because we haven't got the money. So we've got to find the money from some other, some other way. And the symphony orchestras are doing it by financing from concert revenue. So the whole thing's wrapped into one promotion. Do you handle distribution internally within Gimel or do you work with partners for that? No, we work entirely with Hyperion actually, and in this country, Harmonia Mundi, but they also have gone, basically yeah. gone. Yeah. You know, those record shops have gone, the, the distributors are cracking up. It's a terrible scene out there. It is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not the end of the world, though, because I notice every group is making records. I mean, there are more records than ever. No one's buying them, but, but groups are making, <laughs> uh, are making lots and yeah. lots of records. We have a nu nuclear bunker filled with them <laughs> so, <laughs> out in Virginia at our uh, National Audiovisual Conservation Center, oh. which is pretty well, interesting. <laughs> you. And um, another thing that you, you've been focus on, focusing on lately is the uh, foundation at Merton College, Oxford. Yes. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, um, this is a wonderful idea. Um, Merton College, Oxford is the oldest college in Oxford or Cambridge in its foundation. It was tr founded in 1264. And before that, there were, it was clearly a group of students there, scholars, whatever you want to call them, living in a sort of community. So, but that happened in Oxford and Cambridge, but, def, but mostly earliest in Oxford. And, and the buildings that are there for Merton are the earliest sort of, um, const, what do you call it, communal buildings for a properly founded college. The chapel was started in 1264. Um, and it's a fantastic chapel. I mean, it's, it's the size of a small cathedral. It's architecturally completely unspoilt. And there was no choral foundation. The choral foundations in Oxford and Cambridge came later. They all came in the 50, 14th and 15th centuries. And we're talking about um, the 13th here. So anyway, I said, and a wonderful sound. We'd been recording in there for many years. I said to the warden, why is there no choral foundation here? It's, it's just elementary. And the warden said, I don't know. <laughs> um, so we worked on it, and we, we got the money together. How long one, of, you one of your countrymen helped us oh, quite a bit. Great, wonderful. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> uh, had you been director of music for a period already before the, the establishment of the film? No, I just made records there for years. I mean, w w the history of that was that we made records in Merton in the, when we started in the 70s and early 80s. We then, it then got noisy, or so I can't remember. We went to the countryside when we could afford to. We went to a lovely church in the middle of nowhere in Norfolk and made records there. That was lovely. Uh, then we couldn't afford it anymore, so we went back to Oxford. It's as simple as that. And it was while we were doing the second s s spate of recordings that we, I worked out this, this question about, about the Choral Foundation. Is it a mixed voice yeah. choir? Okay. Yes. How do you approach conducting the, the younger singers versus your professional singers? 
Well, it's difficult. I, I'm, uh, I find conducting inexperienced singers quite difficult. I, well, I think they find it quite difficult to follow me, actually. I don't have an orchestral beat. I've never conducted an orchestra. So, you know, that sort of what orchestral conductors, all that kind of thing. It's, it's not quite right for, for the music I do with professional singers, which is polyphonic music, as you know. And, and there are no bar lines, as you can see from those scores right there. Uh, and so it's much more appropriate to conduct it sort of sweeping through without doing this heavy downbeat, which is what um, inexperienced people need. They need to know where the bar starts. Well, that's the problem. So I've... I've had to sort of work on that a bit. Mm. <laughs> and the other thing about Merton is that the, it's got tremendous acoustics and the distances are quite wide. It's quite a wide chapel, so I'm standing here and some of them are over there, you know, and I have to sort of... that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Um, you are in the process of recording all of the Josquin yes. masses, and you yep. just released the sixth Six of nine yes. recordings, and the last one will be out in 2020, 2021, is you, that correct? You, you're very good, oh, yes, wow. that's right. Thank I do you. work in the library. Yes. After all. <laughs> uh, He's yeah, good. I, I, I remember them, though. Uh, what has the experience been like of recording all the Josquin masses? Well, it's true. We've, there are 19 of them, or sort of 18 of them, with, a, with an optional 19th. Mm -hmm which probably isn't by him, but it's an interesting piece. So, anyway. And it makes up the, the last record quite neatly. So we're going to do 19 masses in this series. And we've actually released, so it's nine discs, two, two masses to a disc and one that has three. Um, and so we're going to release, we've released six of the nine. And, and we've recorded the next two, and we've got the last one to do this month, right at the end of the year. Um, and then we have to edit them. And the thing about this is that Josquin died in, in 1521. And I'm hoping this will be really a big year for, for us all to celebrate him. And we, I want this set of discs out by 2020 so that we can say that they're there already right at the start of the year and also plan a worldwide tour of, of, of all these masses in different places. So, I don't know, we, we'll probably go to Japan that year, they'll have two of them. We'll come here, so, you know, two, two twice at least, and we'll do some, some here, and so on. So we cover the whole 19 around the world, and we make a, a, a noise about it. We make a brochure and all that kind of thing. And, it, you know, it looks exciting. Are there any specific interpretational issues that you are focusing on as you go through the cycle? Mm. Well, Josquin is a very subtle composer, and he he's not someone whose style you can suddenly say that's that's definitely him you he, he's quite experimental and and that means it's difficult just to say he should be done like this um and i think that's pl underplaying him anyway to turn him into palestrina for example who does have the same style more or less consistently and and there are merits in that i love palestrina's music but Josquin is much more difficult to just to say, okay, yeah. So and one one and he he poses real technical problems. This is one of his things. He he writes um, ranges of voice voice ranges that go two octaves. And modern singers are not trained to sing like that. You know, that, that, that you, a, a tenor, so called, has a specific range when you're learning tenor, and um, these parts just wander all over the place. So, and we rather like a balanced, blended sound from top to bottom of. It's quite possible that Josquin didn't expect anything of the kind that we like, but I want to do it my way. And I'm not trying to impose, I'm not trying to take anything away from the music, but I, I'm trying to impose a sound, trying to produce a sound through it, if you like, that we will collectively find attractive and, and enable us to listen to the music with pleasure. What he, what he heard in his time, we will never know. For the program this evening, is there a specific thematic thread or some kind of pacing consideration that um, went into selecting the program and also the sequence of the repertoire? Well, this is a Christmas program. I'm, I'm always being asked to put to, at this time of the year. It's a bit of a challenge, actually, because there isn't that much. Um, the Christmas music is, is much more sort of popular music. Polyphony of the complicated variety 
tended not to be written for cathedrals. It tended to be written for a, for courtly chapels, much smaller buildings than a huge cathedral. And and so it gets rather specialised. And I, so what I do, I've resorted to doing is is finding appropriate texts, normally to do with the Virgin Mary. So there's a Salve, the Ave Maria, the Magnificat, which is actually an Advent text, but we're in Advent, of course. We always tour in Advent, actually. <laughs> this Christmas thing starts quite early. <laughs> you may have noticed, but, um, but Advent's rather a difficult, I find Advent quite difficult to pin down conceptually, so. <laughs> But anyway, there are texts which go very well with Advent, and Mag the Magnificat is one of them. So this evening we're singing a Magnificat. The, um, the Josquin Praetorarum Serium Motet, which is the basis for the Mass we're singing, um, is also a Christmas text. Very mystical text, wonderful. Um, so, but specifically Christmas, so it's not quite right for, for, for Advent, but you know. So we'll you've, got, you. you've got some, yeah, I think. In the second half, you've got Hodie Christus Natus Est. That's quite good. I mean, that, that's a giveaway. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Um, is there anything in particular in the comparison of the two Salve Regina settings that uh, we should be listening out for? No, or? well, I have to tell you now. Okay, here's a bit of a story. We're not singing the Salve Regina by De Samisi. Can you recover from your disappointment? Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Because um, it's just not a very good piece. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to put it like that, but I, I take risks. You know, when I'm planning, we've done an awful lot of Christmas tours, and I, I, I take risks. I say I, come to, I love coming here in order to experiment with repertoire, and it's absolutely true. And I, I don't know very much about De Sermisi, and I just thought, well, there's a Salve Regina there. It looks really nice. Um, so I put it down without ever having heard it. But, but I often do this. And these risks are, usually come off really nicely, but, but not this time, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, uh, the one of the, I mean, I could have saved it. It's too long, and it, it's not very interesting to really, but I could have saved it, I think I could have saved it, if there had been an edition of it which was reliable. But actually, the edition, the only edition I could find without going back to the sources, and I didn't have time to do that, um, is rubbish. It, there are two moments which you just can't sort out. I mean, we're quite experienced amongst ourselves at rewriting these pieces of music when they don't work to our satisfaction. <laughs> but this time I just couldn't do it. And I just thought, no, no, made a mistake. So we're going to sing a setting of the Salve by Josquin. Great. Yeah, so, you, you know, I think you, you've lucked out there. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so the there's, there's Josquin is going to replace that. And then the second piece is by Hernando Franco, who's a a Mexican composer. Yeah, first generation Renaissance Mexican. Wonderful piece of music. That is really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you performed his repertoire much before? Well, there isn't. I don't know very much about it. We've we've been to Mexico a few times now, um, and we have been encouraged by the person who booked us there to make a record of to explore more about Franco and and Padilla, who's the other great Mexican composer. We've seen quite a lot of Padilla, in fact. Um, not Franco, but I was really, I was really delighted to find this man. He's, he's, yeah, no, I hope so. We just got to, you know, keep going long enough to cover all these exciting things because there's all the Josquin to do, and then there's all that English stuff, and and then there's, uh, I don't know, the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. There's so much to do. Do you have any specific recordings booked for after the Josquin? No, there's a problem, uh -oh. a financial one. I mean, I just don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We've got, we put this money aside to make the ninth disc. Mm -hmm. um, we can afford that. We've then got to edit it, which costs money, mm -hmm. and produce the, cop you know, the books. And if we're going to do a proper CD, it's got to have a nice booklet and uh, all that. And then I just, I mean, as things are going at the moment, I don't see how we're going to, what we're going to do after that in the format that we're using at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's very disappointing. I mean, what I would really, okay, well, I, I can answer the question. I mean, if I had the money, I would, I would do a record of, of the Eton Choir Book repertoire. Does that mean anything to you? Yes, yeah. Yeah. The Eton Choir Book is um, a huge manuscript that's very fortunately, it's not complete, but it's, most of it's there, in Eton College Chapel. It was composed for that chapel. 
uh, in about, it, it would have wrapped up in 1502. The, the, the time that it was compiled was about 1495 to 1502. And it, it contains a whole repertoire of extraordinary music. Very difficult to sing. Very few groups can sing it, basically. So I, I would, we hope we can, and, and it, would, it would be great to have some of that stuff out there. But it'll cost. Yeah. Do you have an American Friends group? No. <laughs> you might have members, though. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Great. So are. I think uh, we'll open it up to questions, if that's yeah. okay. Uh, and if you have a question, just stick your hand up in the air. My colleague Jay will bring a microphone to you, as we do want to record you for the permanent archives. Select your wording accordingly. <laughs> Th thank you. Um, I'm personally partial to Joscan's motets. Do you have any plans to, in a more minor way, explore the, the motets at the same time you're celebrating the masses in, in 2020, 21? I understand you, you're, you don't have a project to record all of the motets, but are you going to be fitting in, help, helping people understand his non-MISA mm. repertoire? Well, yes, I hope so very much. I mean, the, the thing about the motets is they tend to be scored for more voices than the masses. One of the interesting thing about the masses is that they're all, all scored for four voices only, whereas the bigger motets, like the one you're going to hear this evening, which is in many ways the best of them, this Praetorarum was, this motet that starts the concert tonight, was in, incredibly influential at the time. I'm sure you know it if you're a follower of the motets, but... Um, it's got, a, it's got a sort of sonority to it that's quite unique. And, it, and a lot of the composers that followed Joscan took it up as a, as a model. Anyway, that doesn't answer your question. I mean, I'm, I, we do this motet a lot, and there are plenty of others. I've just put down the Pater Noster, the, you know, the Lord's Prayer, for a concert next year. But there are many of them. Well, I just decided, in fact, the motets are more famous. I, I've, what I've done all, all my career is, is try to put forward really good pieces that nobody knew at the time that we recorded them. Um, and that's helped quite a number of composers become fairly mainstream. Um, I could instance them, but I, anyway. Um, yeah. So but, um, the, so, but the motets are already fairly well established. So, well, not all of them, I agree, and there are a lot of them. Um, I just had to, I, I can't do everything. So we decided we'd do the masses, and uh, I'd love to do some motets with them. Joscan tended, well, didn't um, base his masses on any of his own motets, so we're not going to get that little neat sandwich that you can get with some of these composers, like Palestrina. Hmm. Great. Next question in the back. Yeah, I know you all did the um, premiere of Taverner's last piece, the Requiem Fragments. Oh, so yes. It's a wonderful piece. Um, are there, now that he's gone, and you all have had a, had a long history of performing his works, are there other con more contemporary composers that you're sort of trying to reach for in the future, or that you say, oh, my God, these guys, people aren't really performing, and they really should be performing? Mm. Yeah, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, Nico Muli. I don't know whether you've come across him. He's American. Oh, yeah. We've commissioned him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you like the piece? Yes, I, he, it was called uh, Compare Notes, and it was for Daniel Hope and uh, Jeffrey Cahane, a violin piece. And then uh, we had the choir from Temple Church in London do his Magna Carta piece mm -hmm. when the Lincoln Cathedral copy came here ah. two years ago. Yeah. Terrific. Well, there you go. So um, uh, the, the Lincoln Center commissioned Nico Muli to write us a set of lamentations, um, which he did. and. I think it's absolutely f fantastic. I, we've just been on a tour of Australia, and we sang it every night. So we really know these Lamentations by Nico really well. And it goes, it fits very well with, you know, the Renaissance uh, settings, the Talis in particular, we did alongside it. And it makes such an exciting... Uh, if, 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 the, if the modern composer has got it right, as Arvo Pert does, that music matches up, so if it can be made to match up in the way that Pert does it with Renaissance style, then we have a fantastic half of a concert where we can just make these comparisons and I, I find them thrilling and I think they've gone down very well. So I'm hoping Nico, I think the Lincoln Center are going to ask him to write a, a follow-up 
So I look forward mm. to that. I mean, so, so the answer is Arvo Pert, we sing a lot, but he now won't write any more. He's 81. Uh, so I'm afraid that's that. And Taverner's dead. And um, there's Nico. There's Eric Whitaker. He wrote us a piece. Uh, he was very, very good about that. I, I, I like that piece. He, he was very careful in the way he wrote it, specifically for us. There's Gabriel Jackson we've commissioned. Um, hmm. Quite a few. Great. Mm. Um, next question over here. This is really a, a question out of ignorance, but I wondered if over time, say the last 30 or 40 years, research has revealed anything that might have changed things in your performance practices? Mm, well, that's, yeah. Um, if the scholars had been able to find good evidence of, of how they sang in those days, that would be very interesting. Um, because then we would know whether we were on the, well, whether the, you see, the, the early instrument thing was that, was the, the whole thing was that, they, that the instruments they found were what the composer was writing for. So you're then able to produce the sound that the composer actually wrote for in those early orchestras or, or whatever those instruments were playing. So the instruments are there, you can play them and get the sound. We can't, put, we can't do that with our thing. So, so I'm left, I mean, in a rather fortunate but ambiguous position of, of guessing and trying to make the music come alive f for today, for us. And uh, the scholars can't tell me that I'm wrong, <laughs> but they certainly can't tell me I'm right either. <laughs> um, and then there's the question of, I mean, the scholarly arguments about speeds, pitch, ficta, I don't know whether this means anything to you, but I mean, there are, but these arguments never change. I mean, in, tw in the 40 years I've been going, I haven't heard, I mean, they have fads, you know, there are fads of pronunciation. Latin was always, suddenly, about 30 years ago, Latin had to be pronounced in the tradition that the, that the composer came from. So we suddenly had German Latin, French Latin. Uh, that lasted about, really inconveniently, for about six years. Then it went away again. We could go back to our very happily <laughs> Italian Latin, which comes so much more naturally. Um, and stop. So, I mean, there are fads, and there are fads of ficta as well. You can make it sound sort of pre Raphaelite, if you like, by <laughs> not putting in any of the cadence fictas. Um, the pitch thing has come and gone a bit, as you probably know. The English tend to transpose up, but that's sort of gone again now, so it's settling down back towards written pitch again. Mm. They don't know. And, and they argue with each other all the time, so that what I have to do in a rehearsal, you know, I've got an hour to sort this thing out and get a performance going for a big public. I'm just not going to have academics arguing about it just there and then. I mean, you have to make a decision. This is how it's going to be tonight. Maybe not for the next, but tonight it's going to be like this. And it's usually someone always disagrees. And, and <laughs> the last thing you want is critics writing in, in big newspapers who are academics because they always have something to disagree with. Thanks. <laughs> I don't think I can paraphrase your first question to Peter, but I'm wondering if, Peter, you could elaborate a little bit more on audiences around the world and where you can do sort of maybe less experimental things and why that is, whether it's a tradition, cultural, yeah. why? Well, um, in the Western Christian world, it's one thing. At least the Latin is, is something that they know, you know, the audience knows existed and they have a sort of a sense of where the, the music has come from, what the Ave Maria text might mean to people, that kind of thing. But um, we've recently sung a lot in China and Japan and then you're dealing with a very different setup, and very different between those two countries, in fact. Um, the Japanese are extremely knowledgeable about this music and sing it themselves quite a lot, um, but they're not very adventurous. They, so we, when we go to Japan, we tend to sing the same pieces over and over again. I can't experiment very much there. Um, I can slip in an, uh, the odd sort of oddball piece that gets by the censor, but... Um, <laughs> It's really, the, I'll tell you, it's the Victoria Requiem, 
Palestrina's Miss Pape Marcelli, Josquin's Miss Pange Lingua, Talis's Lamentations, the Allegri Miserere in every concert. Um, I'm, I'm not exaggerating too much. Now in China, they, they have no knowledge at all. And they put us on in these symphony halls, which it's important to them to fill. So it, it really is extraordinary business. I mean, um, they, don't, they don't know what to ask for. So I try to put together a program which will... And then they say, well, could we have green sleeves? <laughs> so I say, yep, yeah, yes. <laughs> You can have green sleeves. Uh, the rest of the concert will be more like what we normally do, but I'm sure. And then they, they can come up. The Koreans are very good at coming up with um, local folk songs that have been arranged for SATB a cappella, and we sing those uh, as encores. And that's the way the concerts are sold, really, that, that we'll do our own thing, and, and that's potentially interesting, but, but at the end they'll get something they really know. And on one occasion, um, it wasn't green sleeves, what's that? Um, Amazing Grace. Um, yes. The audience sang it with us. I had to conduct the audience. <laughs> you know, having previously just sung Talis's Lamentations or something, we then, the, th the thing turned into much more like a communal activity. And they loved it. And, and so, yeah, we've been invited back. <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary. Um, that doesn't wholly answer the question, but um, I think, yes, in the Western world, in, in, in Italy they like Palestrina very much, and I mean, that's fine by me, there's so much to do, I can do anything within some sort of guidelines. And very often we're asked to sing in festivals which have a theme, the theme might be a city like Venice, or um, Vienna, and then it, I love planning those programs, and then, then I can get away with experiments because it fits the theme. Great. Yeah. What's the oddest city that's had a theme? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I know that well, was a bizarre question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I could think of one. I mean, sometimes they have. Th you know, the, these are these directors of festivals. They, they they come up with ideas that it's important. You know, it's their job, I suppose. They have to have a, not just the theme of a city, but you know, the dance of death. <laughs> or just dance, actually. There's one. I mean, we've had that recently, and. Hmm. I can't think of them all now. But. Very good. Uh, will you be around for si signing CDs? Yes, at the I end? will, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely be there. So yeah. there will be uh, CDs on sale, and is your book going to be yes, available? Yes, my book well? is available. If you're, I mean, I just mentioned this now, that I've written a book which describes what, which just these questions, actually, of what it's like to go around the world singing this music and who we sing it to, and it's quite an interesting, well, I find an interesting story anyway. <laughs> And I'm very happy. To, I'd love to sign a book. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So we're going to give Peter a break now before the concert. Uh, but thank you all for listening so in, uh, committedly and intently, and yes, uh, for asking some great questions. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for uh, changing, exchanging some ideas with us. And uh, we hope this has been fun for you. And we'll look forward to hearing you and seeing you conduct in a few moments. Exactly. Thank great. you very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.